Hi, my name is Daria Misenzova and welcome to Politeca Workshop. In today's show, we'll talk with an exclusive expert, an American diplomat, uh, U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine 2017-2019, Kurt Volker will be today with us. As we know, Russia has launched uh, the barrages of uh, missiles uh, this uh, week uh, uh, against Ukraine and um, 15 uh, sites uh, had been damaged uh, of uh, infrastructure facilities and they never neglect uh, civilian infrastructure. So what do you make of it? How long could uh, last uh, such terroristic acts? Resilience, determination, and leadership uh, from Ukrainian people really leading the the free world and defending our values against Russia and against this type of fascism. So it is really incredibly impressive. And so I, I just wanted to just express our thanks to the Ukrainian people for what you're doing and what you're going through. Um, as far as this week goes, um, Putin is conducting these attacks against Ukrainian cities, civilians, civilian ar- infrastructure, because he can't win on the battlefield. Uh, he is actually losing on the ground. Uh, he lost Kherson. Uh, he lost around Kharkiv. His forces got pushed away from Kiev early in the war. Uh, he's not able to make gains in Donbass, and he is gradually losing more and more territory. So the only thing that Putin can really do is continue these strikes against Ukrainian civilian targets, civilian infrastructure, uh, and try to make life miserable for the Ukrainian people. But it's not going to help them win the war. It's not going to make any difference uh, in the military conflict. It's just going to make people's lives miserable. Uh, And so this week was particularly bad. He's decided to target the energy infrastructure of Ukraine, uh, trying to knock out power, uh, which also in turn controls water supplies, uh, to see what he is able to, to, to take out. He has a limited number of precision guided munitions. He's using them right now, but there's not an unlimited supply. It can't go on forever. And the air defenses that Ukraine has and is getting from the US and Germany are getting better and better. And so you see more and more of the missiles knocked down, uh, of the bombs knocked out, the drones are not getting through. So it is getting better, but still not good enough. And uh, I think we will see the war continue this way with Ukraine making gains on the battlefield and pushing Russia back and Russia trying these attacks on civilians for some time yet to come. So unfortunately, it's going to be very difficult for the Ukrainian people for some time. But I I see them eventually winning. Uh, You know, maybe it's a few months, maybe maybe it's a little bit longer, but I don't see Russia ever regaining the, the, the advantage again. But what do you think, uh, how much power have for now Russia to effort all, the, all these uh, touristic attacks? I mean, uh, if we look uh, from the side of financing these attacks, because it costs uh, a lot for one day, it's like 400, uh, um, 400 millions uh, sometimes, yes. So, uh, um, and uh, what about the military stuff also? Yeah. So uh, Putin's military is in very bad shape. Uh, They have lost a lot of personnel. And so they've had to recruit to try to get new people into the military. These people do not have good training. Most of them do not want to be there. So they're very poorly motivated. And the Russians don't have enough equipment to give them. So they're being sent into the battlefield without the equipment that they need, without the training that they need. They're, They're very ineffective. So Russia is resorting to these expensive weapons, as you indicate, because they can just fire them at at Ukrainian cities and have an impact. Uh, But it's not going to change the direction of the war. Now, how long and how much they have, I I can't be specific about that. I don't know. I'm sure, and from what I've read, they have depleted their supplies a great deal. So they can continue to some degree, but they can't continue forever forever. And it's not going to matter on the battlefield. Yeah, and if we're talking about the um, the words you told before in different interviews, so uh, 
uh, you told that at the end of the year we will uh, we will see the abrupt military turn in war in Ukraine. Did it already happen, or it will be something else uh, at the end? I mean, in yeah. December. Well, I think what we've already seen is very dramatic. Um, seeing the Russian military having to flee Kherson. And the way they did it, uh, they looked terrible. They, they were malnourished. Uh, they had poor uh, supplies. Many of them changed into civilian clothing. Uh, it was really a disheveled military that had to pull out of Kherson. And people in Russia are commenting on this. People in Russia see this and they know how bad this was. And I think we're going to see more of that and more images of that that be impacting Russia. I don't think that the Russian military is just collapsing at the moment, though. They are continuing to fight uh, in Donbass, particularly around Bakhmut. Some of those who withdrew from Kherson will now try to join that fight. Uh, so it's not over yet. The Russian military is not collapsing yet. But I think there will be a time when the Ukrainian military is making such gains, including in the southeast, isolating the forces that are now in southern Ukraine, isolating Crimea, putting the Kerch Strait Bridge within range of attack, all of these things uh, will add up to make the uh, Russians unable to sustain their uh, attack force. What do you expect uh, of NATO if the investigations confirm the guilt of Russia? of the death of civilians when the rockets uh, fell off in Poland, NATO country. And it's not, uh, it's a precedent, you know. Um, so uh, what do you think, uh, what decisions from NATO could be expected? The first thing is to get the facts. And I believe there's a lot of information that Ukraine has and that Poland has, NATO has, that needs to be investigated and needs to be made public. So we need to have the facts. The second is uh, whether this was a deliberate attack by Russia on NATO territory, or was it an accident? And I think the most likely scenario is that it was an accidental attack. Uh, they did not intend to attack NATO, and they did but not they did intend, it. sorry? But they did it not the first time. Well, they, they hit Moldova uh, previously. This is the first time hitting a NATO country. Uh, and I, I think it was an accident. They didn't intend to do it. I don't think Russia wanted to start a conflict with NATO. And I'm sure that most NATO allies don't want to be in a conflict with Russia. So it, they're looking at how to de-escalate this. But we do need to get to the facts. The initial information from Poland is that it could have been Ukrainian air defenses that deflected a missile or that themselves landed in Poland. Either way, it's Russia's responsibility because Russia should not be attacking Ukraine to begin with. Uh, and Ukraine should not have a need to use these air defense missiles. Uh, but that being said, there's more information yet to come out. It does seem that NATO is determining that this was not an intentional Russian attack at this time, and therefore only really giving Russia a warning at this point. Yeah, but we know that Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the general secretary of NATO, uh, told that this is the responsibility of uh, uh, Russia. So what do you think, how uh, long could uh, take these investigations uh, compared, for example, with the case uh, of Boeing? Do you remember? I think you remember it. Uh, mm -hmm. when, uh, it happened and it took a lot of time. Yeah, this is much simpler. Uh, because we do have our own, when I say our NATO military forces in Poland, uh, Polish forces, American forces, people are watching the skies very carefully. Ukraine itself has done an outstanding job tracking all of the missile attacks, where they're launched from, what types of missiles, where they land, what the targets were. So I believe that there's a lot of information out there that uh, the Ukrainians and the Poles will talk about first. Uh, there'll be further briefings at NATO, and, and hopefully more of this will come out in public in, in due course. Yeah, and uh, uh, what do you think about the pick point for um, establishing the no-fly no zone over the countries? Maybe this case, when the NATO country is involved, it is the time uh, 
not to think about, but uh, to to do the actions to make something. Yeah, I personally agree with that. Uh, I think that's exactly what NATO should do. I don't believe that NATO is ready to do that, however. Uh, back in February, when this war began, I, I was among many people who favored a no-fly zone uh, over Ukraine. And I still think it's the right thing to do. Uh, we should not accept that Russia dominates or has access to Ukrainian airspace against Ukraine's will, and Ukraine can invite countries in for assistance. And I see no reason why we can't do that still. Maybe only over Western Ukraine, Kiev and West, only the Western part of the West of the Dnieper River. But it, it is important for the safety of civilians. And as you're pointing out, it would also assure the safety of NATO territory that is currently vulnerable, as we saw with this missile landing in Poland. But uh, what do you think, uh, what should happen to, for uh, this step uh, be uh, really in, in real? Well, it would be, um, it would have to be a decision at NATO. So we've already begun consultations there, and I think there will be more. I don't think it's over today. And I think the United States would have to be uh, a leader in this. We have to say that we're willing to support it. Unfortunately, the U.S. position right now, President Biden's position, is not to have any American forces directly engaged. Uh, that he he's willing to provide military equipment and training to Ukrainians, but no direct involvement of U.S. military personnel in Ukraine. So uh, under these conditions, I don't see it happening right now. But we should always keep the door open because uh, it does make sense. And if we were to see another Russian attack, uh, I think we would have a harder time concluding that it's uh, an accident. I, I think if it, if it continues, then you can only assume that it's intentional. What are the, for example, three factors we need to take into account when uh, we are... Uh, we need to understand uh, the position of Biden in this case. Uh, so they don't want to be engaged in the war, but they are already engaged uh, when they help us. <clears throat> yeah. So I think the factors th that the Biden administration is looking at, they do not want the war to widen and become a general war, global war, world war. Um, they don't want to see a NATO-Russia war. Second... But I think that this war is already started from 24th of February. Yeah, well, it's a war in and against Ukraine, but not against NATO. And I think the Biden administration is very conscious about not making it about NATO, but it being Russian aggression against Ukraine and helping Ukraine to defend itself. So that's that's the first thing. You don't want to have more countries involved. The second is they don't want to see an escalation to the use of nuclear weapons, uh, that this would be um, very dangerous to set a precedent that nuclear weapons can be used in a battle and could also lead to re reprisals of nuclear mm -hmm. weapons, especially if there's an attack on a NATO country, which could also escalate and get out of hand. So uh, nuclear use uh, is another thing that they are very, very worried about. Um, and then a third thing, I think, is the perceptions uh, in, in the world. Um, they're very conscious about not creating an image of moral equivalence. Of, well, Russia's fighting and U.S. is fighting, and it's not really about Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's really some superpower conflict and uh, just happens to be in Ukraine. And I think they want to not let that impression to take hold. Uh, they want to be clear and the, and the world to be clear that this is unprovoked and unjustifiable Russian aggression against Ukraine and Russian war crimes against Ukraine. Ukraine is simply defending itself. So keeping that political message firmly in focus is also important. Mm, yeah, mm, but do you think uh, the electorate uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, is agreed uh, with the, this position? Uh, I think that the U.S. public opinion, it, it goes in different strands. So on the one hand, the American people are very supportive of Ukraine. They see Ukraine as a victim of unprovoked aggression. They've seen the war crimes. 
They, uh, they want to provide humanitarian assistance. There's lots of volunteerism going on. They approve of the U.S. providing weapons to Ukraine. Very strong support. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a concern that the U.S. is, doing, is supporting Ukraine by itself. They, they don't see Europe doing enough. They don't see other allies doing enough. And that becomes a political problem in the U.S., that the public will say, well, why are we doing this and the Europeans are not? How come they're not providing German tanks? And why are they not providing more weapons? And why are they uh, not providing more budgetary support to Ukraine? How come the U.S. is doing all this? What do you think? Why? Don't well, you think the Germany, for example, uh, plays the double game, uh, what we're talking about a lot uh, by yeah. experts. Well, Germany is doing some things, but they can do more. And uh, I don't think that the American people feel that Europe is doing as much as it can. And I think Germany in particular, as you, as you point out, has been very reluctant to provide budgetary support. And uh, this, is, this is harming Ukraine. And it is an area that Germany can do if they're reluctant on the military side because of history. Uh, they can certainly do more on the economic side, but we're not seeing that happen either. Yeah, but what do you think about double game uh, by uh, Germany? Do you agree I think, with Yeah, I think um, it's more to do with inertia, fear and inertia, uh, not so much uh, deliberately trying to mislead, but uh, they they say they want to support, but then... They're not comfortable with military support. They're not comfortable being in front. They're not comfortable spending that much money when they have budgetary issues and high energy prices at home. So it's more, um, I think, inertia and reluctance than deceit. Don't you think that uh, the point is that European countries uh, are afraid of invasion by Russia, but the other? No. <laughs> They really don't expect it, and that, that's the reason why they don't want to lose their military staff and send it to, to, to Ukraine. Yeah, well, well, that, I agree with that. Uh, I think that they do not feel uh, threatened directly themselves, absolutely. And they also, I think, want to get back to a situation of a normal relationship with a normal Russia. So they don't want to just demonize Russia. Uh, and they're not really willing to separate Putin and his regime from the Russian people. And I think that's what we need to do and, and say and be very clear. As long as Putin is in power and Russian forces are attacking Ukraine, there should be no hesitation about providing arms and finances and support to Ukraine. And Putin should be treated as a pariah. Uh, it would be fine to have a normal relationship with Russia if Russia had a normal government, uh, but not with Putin, who is denying the existence of Ukraine, killing Ukrainian people directly engaged in some form of, of genocide. There, there should be no compromise with that. Yeah, but uh, maybe you say need to push uh, Germany or uh, others like France, uh, um to do more for ukraine is there any possibility yeah i think so um never we should never give up i think uh, there is an idea out there of all countries that are using these german-made leopard tanks should perhaps form a consortium and together provide those tanks to ukraine and that would also help with parts and maintenance for those tanks so I think ideas like that do have merit, and I think that we should continue to push for them. Mm -hmm, yeah, because we need to remember that Japan and uh, Germany are very important partners uh, for mm -hmm. uh, USA. But what to, what is your opinion on the air defense aid uh, for Ukraine after the other um, attack uh, this week uh, by uh, Russian force, military forces, uh, do Ukraine could expect dramatically the, the increase of uh, such aid? Uh, 
Yeah, I think that the air defense assistance is improving dramatically right now. Uh, for, for I can't explain why, but the U.S. and Western Europe were slow in getting Ukraine air defenses over the course of the summer. So only later on in, in October did we really see some of the best systems arrive. Uh, I think Ukraine now actually has very good air defenses. Uh, look at the number of missiles that are being shot down. Uh, so it's actually working quite well. Very difficult to get 100%. Uh, because, you know, Russia is launching these drones and missiles in large numbers. And you might take down 80 to 90%, but that 10% that gets through is still very dangerous. And I, and I think that's what we're facing now. And I think it will continue to get better because there'll be more and more provision of supplies from the U.S. and, and Germany and others. Uh, I know that you told uh, in one of the interviews that there is a good control of uh, the um, of, of the military weapon which uh, Ukraine receive, and mm -hmm. uh, but we know that uh, some uh, Republicans or even some Democrats they tell, oh, we need to uh, to be uh, to to control it better. So. Uh, is it a point of uh, don't lose their like uh, their military stuff, or maybe it's a point to uh, to make it longer this uh, the time uh, how uh, arrive uh, arrives uh, this weapon? No, I think instead it's a way of sustaining political support. Uh, you do have voices in the U.S. who question whether we should be providing aid to Ukraine at all. Uh, and how much, and maybe what we're doing is too much. So when you have those voices saying that we need to have accountability is a way of giving them reassurance mm -hmm. that the money we're spending is indeed being spent well. And I believe that to be true. Uh, the military assistance is going to the Pentagon, which then gives it to U.S. defense industry to buy new stuff, and we provide uh ukraine with some older equipment and some new equipment the budgetary support it's going to the world bank the world bank is reimbursing ukraine on the basis of actual expenses so i think there are tremendous means of accountability already in place so there's no worry when we talk about having accountability but it does help sustain political support. Let's talk a little bit about G20, Kurt. We know that this summit took place this week and Ukrainian officials hoped that Russia would be excluded from uh, the G20, but the reality is more cruel uh, for us. Why it didn't happen? Yeah, well, first off, Putin chose not to go to the G20 because he would have been very sharply criticized by most of the countries there. So he sends Lavrov instead. Lavrov only stayed for one day, uh, did not stay a long time either, probably also very uncomfortable for him. And did they, there are many countries there did complain about Russia's continuing war. Uh, excluding them from the G20 has not happened yet. I think there will be a couple of countries that would not agree on doing that. Like but China, for example. Like China perhaps would not. But I think that the message that came out of the G20 was certainly very critical towards Russia. Uh, yeah, but uh, what do you think? Uh, why it didn't happen like it was uh, with G7? Well, the G7 is more like-minded. It's basically uh, Western democracies plus Japan. Uh, so it's a very like-minded group of countries that can make such a decision easily. G20 is more diverse, has you know a lot of representatives from the global south, more diverse set of interests. And a lot of them, uh, while critical of Russia, don't want to burn all of their bridges with Russia for the long term either. If we are talking uh, in total uh, uh, about diplomacy, what do you think? Uh, could we tell that... Uh, people that Russia is totally became an outcast after after uh, G20 and uh, after all these statements from different officials. Uh, yeah, I would say that Russia is a pariah state already. If you look at the level of sanctions that have been applied against Russia 
it's, it's unprecedented, the, the seriousness of these sanctions that are being implemented. The UN General Assembly resolutions that condemned Russia's aggression against Ukraine, uh, the unwillingness of countries, even China, to actually help Russia evade sanctions, um, that that's all very significant. And I think Putin may be even surprised at the degree of solidarity in the world to uh, push back on Russian aggression. Would we expect that, that uh, there will be, for example, secondary sanctions or something that could really work uh, quicker because uh, Ukraine lose time uh, and lose people? Yeah, well, the sanctions that are in place are actually very severe. And they have impacted Russia's ability to get spare parts, to get microchips. They can't manufacture their own weapons right now, so they're having to go to Iran and North Korea. Um, there's no luxury goods. People, when they travel, they can't use their Russian credit cards. They're blocked. So there are serious sanctions in place already. And I think that people will look at additional measures. Uh, secondary sanctions, as you said, anyone who helps with uh, sanctions evasion, uh, additional Russian banks that are not currently covered, so you make the financial transactions even harder. And one thing that I hope we come to, which so far no one has done, is to seize the Russian central bank reserves and use that as a fund for supporting Ukraine and uh, budgetary support in Ukraine reconstruction. It hasn't happened yet, but I, I do believe we have to do that as well. Yeah, how long to wait for it? Uh, what well, it's hard to predict. Um, there are people on Capitol Hill who support it, but I think the administration in the U.S. is opposed, and most European governments are opposed. Uh, but the more the war goes on, the more war crimes that we see, the more clear it is that Russia is violating all international standards of behavior. And so they shouldn't benefit from the protection of those standards when it comes to their central bank reserves. Yeah, but what should happen uh, when uh, European countries, when U.S. say, uh, uh, would say, uh, we are not uh, opposed, uh, we are for it, for sanctions? Uh, yeah. it, so Europe, there are countries in Europe that are in favor, but not everyone. And so it's, it would take all of them in the EU to agree and make this decision. And the European Central Bank would have to agree and implement it. And Europe is not there at the moment either, as, and neither is the U.S. administration. So maybe there should be a lot of more uh, like um, situ crisis situations in Europe when they decide uh, we couldn't manage it. What do I think yes. about I think that's possible. And I think also when they actually start spending 18 billion dollars, 18 billion euros in budgetary support for Ukraine out of Europe's own money, money that they don't ha really have, uh, I think that may make the Russian funds more tempting and say, OK, maybe we should actually be doing this rather than taxing European taxpayers. If we're talking about the uh, Russia and how they uh uh, could behave in the future and what are the future of these countries. So what I hear from some experts is that they're ready to be uh, the same as uh, North Korea and uh, they were prepared for it a uh, long time before the war. So uh, does Iraq is ready for any casualties uh, or maybe there is a big points when they could stop uh, to this uh, terrorism, uh, what do you make of it? Well, I believe that the Russian people will, will not be satisfied with being a North Korea. Uh, North Korea is a country of deep privation, police state, uh, complete lack of information and access to the rest of the world. And I think Russia is too sophisticated. The people are too well educated to live in a country like that. And I think what, you, what we're going to see is as Putin continues to wage this war, he gets less and less support from the Russian people and the Russian elites. And I think at a certain point, they will have to act to stop Putin. Uh, that there's no oh. way. Uh, oh, do uh, that's up to them. That's up to them. For it? Uh, there's always a possibility. If you look in history, you know, they, they removed the czars. 
they removed um, Gorbachev. They broke up the Soviet Union into constituent states. So there's always a possibility. But it can only be the Russian people themselves that lead on this. And I think everyone in Russia knows now that Putin is destroying the country, that he's destroying the military while losing over half of their capabilities. Uh, he's destroying the economy. He's destroying Russia's reputation. He's destroying opportunities for the Russian people to travel and, and uh, to be engaged in the world. They all see it. They all know it. And I think it is creating strains in society that eventually will uh, become too much. Yeah, but what do you think uh, is uh, uh, what could be the step uh, and from uh, whom, or from the society, from the masses, or from the officials who are somewhere near from uh, near uh, Putin? Yeah, my own sense is that it's going to come from the intelligence services, the military, and the former KGB. Uh, they're all smart people. They all know what's happening. They see how Putin is destroying the country. And they're the ones that have means of power to actually make a change. So that's what I would expect. Not this week, not next week. I don't expect it soon. But the longer this goes on, the more Russia is weakened by Putin's actions, uh, the more likely it is that they can act. Um, do you observe that uh, China could be a negotiator between uh, Ukraine and Russia, what we hear now from the experts? No. Um, they're very different countries. And China has its own interests. And China is a bigger, stronger, more economically powerful, more military and politically powerful country than Russia. So they are not driven by Russia's desire to attack and kill Ukrainians. Uh, they don't want to be associated with that. And indeed, they haven't provided military support to Russia. They haven't provided economic support to Russia. Uh, China would rather just not be involved. Uh, as for mediation, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that Putin wants mediation, and I don't think China is eager to step into the middle of this. Uh, Putin, I think, wants to keep fighting. He's not ready to negotiate. Erdogan is closer to this and has been willing to try to play a mediating role. Uh, but again, Russia is not ready to negotiate. Yeah, and uh, the last but not the least, uh, what do you think, what could be the end of the war? I hear that there could be the end, like, uh, by a Korean scenario, for example, without peace agreement, uh, or uh, there uh, should be another way. How uh, no, do you see it? I don't, I don't believe that Ukraine will accept Russian occupation over its territory anymore. And so they will work to push Russia out. And the US and other allies are going to help Ukraine with equipment and training uh, in order for Ukraine to be able to do that. So either Russia is pushed out of Ukraine or their own forces do collapse eventually uh, because of lack of supplies and organization and training and so forth, which is quite possible. Uh, so the Russian military could collapse, Ukrainians could push them out of Ukraine, or as we were just talking about, the Ukrainian elite stop Putin from continuing this crazy war. Uh, all of those are, are possibilities. Uh, and how long uh, it takes? Well, uh, you know, no one can give you a concrete answer. It, it just depends on the course of events. It does look as though this is going to go well into next year. I think Ukraine will continue fighting and fighting well throughout the winter. Russia will have a very hard winter because the Russian forces will, because they're deployed, they depend upon food and fuel and ammunition supplied from Russia. Very difficult to get it to them uh, and increasingly difficult as Ukraine attacks the supply lines. Uh, but I think this will continue well into next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for your time.